Welcome, I'm Father Mitch Paco, and welcome to Scripture and Tradition. As we celebrate this season of our Lord's resurrection, as we say at my church and at many other churches that have their roots in uh, the East, uh, Christ is risen, indeed He is risen. Christos Anesti, Alithos Anesti, or as we say at my parish, Messiah come, hakan come. It's a great celebration of the Lord's resurrection after our celebration of Great Lent. Today, we will be bringing to an end our look at the death of Christ, especially take a look at the seven different reactions to the death of Jesus Christ as it happened. And then we'll start to take a look at the resurrection. Now, if you have any questions or comments related specifically to today's topic, we invite you to be part of the show by doing as some of these nice people have come all the way from the great Republic of Texas to be part of our audience. You can always be in our live audience. Uh, or you can call us during the live show. And uh, the live show is on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and the number to call from North America is 1-800-221-9460, 1-800-221-9460. If you are outside North America, you can still call, but not with that number. The number instead is country code 1, area code 205 Two seven one two nine eight zero. That's one two zero five two seven one two nine eight zero. Or you can send us an email by writing to Scripture and Tradition at ewtn.com. Or you can follow us and participate with the show on YouTube. Now we are just finishing up chapter six of my book, Wheat and Tears, Restoring the Moral Vision of a Scandalized Church. Uh, the book is, of course, still available at EWTN's Religious Catalog. You can get it by just going to EWTNRC.com, where it is item number 81098. And today, we are our discussion begins on page 161. So, Let's take a look at this concluding section, the seven reactions to the death of Jesus. The first is from nature. And as we see in the Gospels, uh, you know, the, for instance, we'll take a look at Luke 23, verse 44. Now, it was about the sixth hour, which is noon, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So there's darkness from noon till 3 p.m. We also see another reaction. By the way, the other Gospels mention that darkness that comes over, and that it's, it's not an eclipse. Um, it's something different than an eclipse. Uh, then we also see in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51, the earth shook and the rocks were split. Uh, there's an earthquake. Now, in fact, Israel is in an earthquake zone. There is a major fault in the surface of the earth that goes uh, all the way from Mount Hermon up in the north by the Lebanese border and the Syrian border. And that fault goes all the way down under the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba to Kenya and becomes the Old Dubai Gorge in Kenya. So that's a very long, and there are a lot of, been a lot, of, a lot of earthquakes in the region. There were a lot of volcanoes. You can see a lot of extinct volcanoes and volcanic material. So uh, the earth shaking is another reaction of nature. And when you go to Mount Calvary, you can go right below it there is a chapel underneath Mount Calvary. So this is a photograph of the top 
of Mount Calvary with pilgrims who are there at the altar. And the lady who is under the altar is right at the spot uh, where you can touch the, the rock of Calvary. It's kind of covered up because so many pilgrims were chipping pieces off. So there's a small hole and you can place your hand and touch the actual rock of Calvary, which is a solid limestone uh, little hill. But underneath, you can see that there is <coughs> a, a, a crack. You can see this is the crack here from the top. And if you go below Mount Calvary, the crack goes all the way down to the bedrock. And it, it's, it's not just a little hair fracture. It's a decent crack. So this was something very important, and uh, it, it, cr it cracked quite significantly. So that's the reaction of nature. The second reaction comes from the underworld. Um, by Sheol, or the place of the dead. And we see this mentioned twice in the New Testament. First, in Matthew 27, verses 52 to 53, it says, the tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, this is something that is very significant because uh, some people, some Christians, do not accept that the body of the Blessed Virgin Mary was later raised from the dead and assumed into heaven. But here we see a number of people who were raised from the dead. This happened at the moment of Christ's death. So I don't think that they should have too much difficulty with this. And uh, that they appear to people, just as Our Lady still does. You know, so this is not something that we should treat as all that surprising. But this is so momentous an event that God the Son died on the cross. These dead are raised from death. There's something else, that, that's what happens to some of the dead, but something else that happens in the underworld is regarding Christ. You take a look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 20. For, God, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So his, this is his human spirit that's still alive, in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons were saved through water. So, this describes how Jesus' human soul descended to the dead. Now, this is mentioned in the Creed, especially the Apostles' Creed. We, the English translation says he descended into hell. Hella was just the old English term for the place of all the dead. It wasn't the place of damnation. It was just where all the souls of the dead went. In later English, it came to mean the place of condemnation, um, but not originally. And that's why we have that in the creed. It's based on this text. And he goes there to preach to them. These are souls who are not condemned in hell, but they certainly aren't in heaven. He had not yet opened the gates of heaven. They couldn't be in heaven. So this is you know, where he goes and preaches to them. And this is a preaching that apparently does them some good. 
they are able to hear his words and come to have faith in Jesus. This is one of the bedrock of events in the life and death of Jesus Christ that gives us our initial understanding of this state of the soul known as purgatory where the various sins are purged, that in this state, be, we're not condemned. And it's not a second chance. It's only for the redeemed. But there is this need for purification. And our Lord purifies them by his word, so they come to faith. And this is a very important part that they can have improvement in the place of the dead. And that's very important. The third response to the death of Jesus Christ is from God Almighty. God the Father reacts. First, on the, in, uh, on the east side of Jerusalem, where the temple was, uh, the priests of Israel were finishing up the slaughter of the lambs, you know, the, uh, Josephus claimed 200,000. He might have exaggerated a little bit, but there still were a lot of lambs that were uh, killed for the Passover. And they had to finish by 3 p.m. They, they had to be done so that from noon to 3 p.m. they slaughtered the lamb because it says in the Old Testament in Exodus that they uh, are to to slaughter the lambs in the evening. So that it started from noon till three. And this finishing of the slaughter at three o'clock is precisely the time of Christ's death. And that is directly connected with John chapter one, verse 29, when St. John the Baptist cries out, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus, the Lamb of God, dies precisely at the time that the last of the Passover lambs dies. But it's because he is that Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and understands the meaning of his death. And then... Keep that context in mind. We read in the Gospels, in Mark 15, verse 38, and in parallels in Matthew 27, verse 51, and Luke 23, verse 45, that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This is significant because if it were from the bottom up, that would be a human action. But if it's from the top, it was a very tall curtain. It wasn't just like six feet. It was a couple stories high and about a foot thick. And for that to tear from the top down indicates that this is a, an act of God. Now, this curtain was a very important one. It was made of wool of different uh, colors. Uh, you see in Exodus 26, verse 31, it's, it tells the Israelite people, you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet stuff and fine twined linen. In skilled work it shall be made. So this is a, a very significant curtain. According to, again, Josephus, the Jewish historian, it took three hundred men to carry that curtain. That's how heavy it was and how large it was. And for that just to uh, tear from the top down by itself is not by itself. We understand that to be a divine act, something that God called for. And it is, there's an allusion to this, I think, I, not only I, others as well, in the uh, Talmud, <coughs> I believe the Babylonian Talmud, in 
<coughs> Tractate Yoma, uh, chapter 9, where it mentions that according to Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, the uh, temple uh, would be 40 years before the temple was destroyed, the door of the temple opened by itself. Now, 40 years before the destruction of the temp temple was destroyed in 70, and here we see that this is something that happens, um, you know, 40 years earlier. So it seems that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai is making an allusion to this. Um, and it's uh, very significant um, because it is an act of God. And we see that uh, a, a way to understand this is that Christ, who at the Last Supper had proclaimed a new covenant, now this is symbolized as his side is rent open by the lance of the soldier and the temple entrance is rent open from top to bottom. And Jesus, as the new Lamb of God, the new Passover sacrifice, is, you know, taking the place of the old sacrifices. I make reference in my book to Hebrews 9, uh, verse 13 and following, uh, where it says, For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred which redeems them from the transgressions under the first covenant. And you can take a look at the whole of chapter 10 to see more about that. But Christ's new covenant replaces the old. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant was behind that curtain. By this point, it was empty. There was nothing there. In fact, the Roman general, Pompey the Great, had insisted and had gone into the Holy of Holies. And it was empty. And in fact, he laughed. Um, Jewish people believed that he was accursed for doing that. Um, and in fact, not too many years later, uh, he died by treacherously. He lost a war to Julius Caesar. And when he tried to escape to Egypt, they met him on the shore and then killed him and cut off his head. Um, but be that as it may, um, we see that the real issue for us as Christians is to make an act of faith that Christ has begun a new covenant and abrogated the old. Uh, it actually had been abrogated back in the time of the Babylonian exile when both the priest Jeremiah, who was also a prophet, and the priest prophet Ezekiel both had said that the covenant was done because of their sins. So now we see that uh, this goes on at this time, that, that Christ begins the new covenant in his blood. All right, we'll take a, a short break here and come back and finish up these last uh, reactions uh, to Christ's death. So please stay with us.
Welcome back. Just want to remind you briefly that Father Miguel Marie, our own uh, Franciscan friars, the MFBA, is leading a pilgrimage to the shrines of Italy in the Amalfi Coast, uh, September 19th to October 1st, 2024. If you want information, just go to visitationpilgrimages.com or call 256-347-1475. Seven five, and you know, sign up for that. Uh, it's a pretty part of it. All right, now we're back to these reactions. The fourth reaction comes from a Roman centurion, and we see in Matthew twenty-seven verse fifty-four when the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake, and what took place. They were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. In St. Mark, it's chapter 15, verses 34 to 39, and Luke 23, verse 47. So that we see uh, this the, the statement uh, of the centurion is very significant. If you remember, every time our Lord cast demons out, and then they would try to say, I know who you are. You're the son of God. You're the holy one of God and various things they would say. And they were frequently announcing Jesus as the son of God in Matthew 8, 29, Mark 1, 24, Mark 3, 11, 5, 7, uh, Luke 4, 34 and 41, and Luke 8, 28. They, these places, the... The demons try to say that. And Jesus silences them. Not because what they were saying was false. He is the Son of God. But he did not want them to say. And he also silenced many of the people who were healed and told them not to tell anybody. But the one time that somebody proclaims him as the Son of God, that he doesn't silence them, is here on the cross when the centurion says, truly, this one is the Son of God. Now, even when Peter made his confession of faith in Matthew 16, verse 16, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Also in Mark 8, 29 and Luke 9, 20, when he makes, when Peter says he's the Son of God, he's also told not to say anything. The only time that somebody can call Jesus the Son of God and not be silenced is here. And this is a very important element. And the, the two times, that, that one other time that there is an open statement of Jesus as the Son of God is in his trial before the Sanhedrin. And the high priest asked, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And we, we see uh, that again in Matthew 26, verse 63, the high priest said to my jury by the living God, tell us you are the Christ, the Son of God. So he's asked the question there, and then he says, it is as you say. But the only person besides Christ who can actually make that affirmation without being silenced is this centurion. And one of the reasons for it is of all the places where he can have his sonship uh, proclaimed, this is one of the most interesting because it brings out that our Lord can only be understood as truly the Son of God when he dies on the cross. The miracles do not bring ultimate conversions. Too many people who saw the miracles did not convert, including the apostles. They ran away on Holy Thursday in Gethsemane. Peter denied them. Judas betrayed them. They, they, the miracles didn't do it. 
But at the death of Christ, this Roman centurion makes this proclamation, truly, you are, this, is, this one is the Son of God. And that's where we understand him best. The fifth reaction to Jesus' death comes from the crowd. Remember how many times we saw the soldiers in the crowd mocking Jesus. Not now. After they had enthusiastically mocked him, we see in Luke 23, verse 48, all the multitudes who assembled to see the sight when they saw what had taken place returned home, beating their breasts. This is not so unusual that after committing sin, um, people experience a type of sorrow. And this is one of the things that goes on here. And this silence in the face of the darkness and the earthquake, the soldiers, the centurions' profession of faith, they all start beating their breasts as an act of sorrow. That's why they uh, beat their breasts. It's an act of sorrow and repentance. The sixth reaction comes from Jesus' followers. They just watch. It says in Luke 23, verse 49, And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance and saw these things. They didn't do anything else. They didn't say anything. They just watched. And the importance of that, of course, is that they are witnesses. They're the ones who tell us what happened told the other apostles and got their word got to the evangelists. So, but they don't do or say anything. They simply watch. And then finally, the seventh reaction comes from another Roman. Um, so that it says in John chapter 19, beginning with verse 32, so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. They would break their legs in order to make them die very quickly, both the shock as well as their inability to hold themselves up. They would die fairly quickly of asphyxiation. Crucifixion was an awful way to die. And the Romans just want to make sure that it's done before sunset because Jewish people have to bury their dead. But when the Roman soldiers came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he tells you the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. Now, there are a couple things here that the uh, bro bones not being broken is a reference back to Exodus when the Passover lamb was to be eaten whole and they were not to break any of its bones. The reason they would break uh, uh, lamb bones after they cooked it was they wanted to eat the marrow, but they're told not to do that. Other times they can break the bones and eat the marrow, not on Passover. It has to be intact. And Christ, the Lamb of God, dies without his bones being broken. Secondly, we uh, also see a prophecy from the prophet Zechariah, uh, chapter 12, verse 10. What's interesting is that when you read the Hebrew text, it doesn't say that shall look on him whom they have pierced. It says they shall look on me whom they have pierced. And it's the Lord God speaking. 
Vehibitu elai, they shall look on me. If it was they shall look on him, it would be Vehibitu elav. But that's not what it says. And there are no textual variants. And it's an amazing verse. How can God be pierced? How can that happen? Except if the Word becomes flesh and dwells among us, and then when He dies on the cross, His side is pierced. This is quoted not only here in John 19, but also in the book of Revelation chapter 1. They shall look on Him whom they have pierced. So this is a very important element. Now, after those reactions, we come to the burial of Jesus. Um, in John 19, verse 38, it says, uh, after this, after Jesus was pierced in the side, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. So he came and took away his body. And you see this referred to in Matthew 27, verse 57, Luke 23, verse 50, Mark 15, verse 43. So it's, it's something that's there. And then we also see that, you know, certainly he was a disciple, so he had an interest in giving an honorable burial. Burying the dead was a very important good deed for Jewish people. You see it back in the book of Tobit, and that's how it made, because of the book of Tobit and Jewish practice, it became one of the corporal works of mercy within the church. And we also hold to that same custom. And then we see also that Nicodemus, who is also a member of the uh, Sanhedrin, came. It says that in uh, John uh, 19, that Nic Nicodemus, who had come to him at night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds weight. Um, that's why in the Maronite church, uh, it was a custom, it still is a custom, to bring flowers to put into a casket with the corpus from a crucifix. You take the corpus off of a crucifix, put it into a casket and fill it with flowers, symbolizing the aloes and myrrh that Nicodemus had put in. And this same Nicodemus had just six months earlier at the Feast of Tabernacles spoken up. In John 7, verse 50, it says that Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who had been one of them, said, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, are you from Galilee too? Notice they put Galilee down. Um, Search and you will see that no prophet is to rise from Galilee. And they went east to his own house. So Nicodemus tried to defend Jesus, but he didn't really know how to at that point. Here, uh, he takes care of Jesus' dead body. We also see women uh, present. Mary Magdalene, who's known in all the Gospels. And then also Mary, the mother of Jesus' brothers. The, she's the mother of James and Joses and Salome. Uh, you see that Mary uh, mentioned in Matthew 27, verse 56, Mark 15, verse 40 and 47. She's also mentioned in the Gospel of John, where she is called not by her children, but by her husband. Uh, in John 19, verse 25, it says, But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Uh, Clopas was the brother of St. Joseph, according to a, a second century Jewish convert named St. Hegesippus. He's the one who identifies Clopas as St. Joseph's 
full brother, and therefore his wife, also named Mary, <coughs> was the sister, or what we would call sister-in-law. They don't have the word sister-in-law, so they just call her sister of Mary. So it wasn't another child of her parents, uh, but you know, her relative through marriage. And uh, that Mary, uh, and by, by the way, she's the one who is also the mother of Jesus' brothers. So the father of Jesus' brothers is Clopas, and the mother is his wife, Mary, not Joseph and the Blessed Virgin. So they have that. And then, uh, I say Mary Magdalene, and then, of course, the, the Blessed Virgin Mary. She's mentioned by St. John. Now, all of these people are present to bury Jesus on that preparation day, that late in the afternoon on Friday between 3 and 6. Uh, the tomb is very close to Calvary. I mean, it's not 75 yards. Uh, it's a very short walk. It's still inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So when you enter the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, Calvary is on your right side. And then you just go around a corner, and there's the tomb of Jesus. And what's left of the stone that was in front of the tomb is inside the tomb. It's on a little pedestal. Uh, a Muslim named Hakim uh, destroyed the tomb, in, much of the tomb, in 1009 A.D. But there's still big parts of it around. So that's what we have there. But it's very close, so it didn't take them long to go from Calvary over to the tomb. That's where Joseph of Arimathea had his tomb. And in fact, if you go inside the Holy Sepulchre, you can see other tombs cut into the rock. Uh, they're, they're also not used now, but you can still see them there. So it was a, it was a cemetery that was there. And they needed to get this finished before sundown because it was the Sabbath. You can't work on the Sabbath. So that's why they have that. And this is something that uh, amazed Pilate. Pilate was, was uh, it says in uh, Mark 15, verse 43, um, that when Joseph or Matthias asked Pilate for the body, Pilate was amazed, uh, said that he wondered if he were already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked uh, you know, whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph of Arimathea for a burial. Uh, Joseph bought a cloth to wrap the body in, uh, in Mark 15, verse 46, a linen shroud, and he wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in the tomb which had been hewn out of rock. Again, this was uh, an old stone quarry. Uh, and you know how in a quarry, when you cut the stone out, it goes down in steps, right? And so they would cut a tomb into the steps. That's where there are a number of tombs. And then they just took a large rock to put over the tomb, so nobody would go in there. And also, tombs were considered unclean uh, because there's a dead body in there. So that's what they did that. And this was uh, very much part of what they did. Now, it adds in the Gospels that the women pay, paid close attention to the location of the tomb because they wanted to come back and finish the various burial rites. Uh, you take a look at Luke 23, verse 55 and 56. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid, and then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath they rested according to the commandment. So they couldn't do anything on Sabbath, but they planned to come the, and they did come the, uh, early on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. Okay? By Romans called it Sunday, uh, and uh, so do we. 
uh, but they just use the number, first day of the week. In Arabic, they do pretty much the same. Uh, it's the first day of the week on Sunday, and then uh, Yom al uh, they do the same thing in Hebrew. So this is, um, you know, them obeying the commandment to rest on the Sabbath. Jesus rested on the Sabbath. He stayed uh, in his tomb. And they planned to come back. And when they did come back on Easter Sunday, they did not come back to the tomb of Jesus in order to witness the resurrection. They came back to the tomb to finish the rites of burial. They fully expected to see the dead body of Jesus and put more of the burial spice, especially myrrh. Uh, that's something that was used for burying the dead. And that's what they expected. They did not expect the resurrected Jesus, and in that they were extremely shocked and surprised. And it will be as they come to him that they are forced in many ways to deal with a whole new level of faith in Jesus. Even these women who had stayed faithful through his death and stood by him through his death, these women, you know, uh, are going to be called to a new level of faith because it's not going to be the corpse they expected, but a resurrected Lord they did not expect at all. We'll continue with that next week. Let's now go to some of your questions. Let's start off with Anastasia in Ohio. Anastasia, what can we do for you? Well, thanks for taking my question. Um, I Absolutely. Well, wondered... First of all, let people know this. Your what? name, this is your season, isn't it? Yes, it is. Resurrection. Anastasia means <laughs> resurrection. Yep. I so think she what, also tended the tomb of St. Peter, did she not? What's that? Didn't Anastasia, wasn't she one of the women that kind of uh, tended St. Peter's um, tomb? As far I that I don't know, but uh, there's no reason for me to doubt that. <laughs> I heard that somewhere. I don't know where. Uh huh. Well, it's time to do more homework and find that out. <laughs> so what can we do for you? Well, um, I know that the church now doesn't consign anybody, no matter how bad they are when they die, to hell. And when um, I've heard the, the gospel talking about Jesus going down to the realm of the dead, and I've heard stories about people in the Old Testament that were really, really bad, and they kind of chalked them up as being, you know, in the in the everlasting damnation, like the guy mm -hmm. that, like mm -hmm. the rich man that dissed um, uh, Lazarus, the poor man, and they talk about the the gulf between him and, and Abraham and all that. But, mm -hmm. I mean, he was in torment, which even a person today, you know, if they died, might be in some torment if they were being purified in purgatory. But he at least had the compassion enough mm -hmm. to be concerned about his brother's. So I'm wondering, you know, even though they kind of paint him as being in like eternal damnation, Jesus hadn't died yet, and until Jesus actually went down to the realm of the dead, wouldn't they have been given the same opportunity to choose or to reject Jesus at that time, regardless of how much purging or how much, you know, they had experienced before that? Okay, okay, Anastasia, and there's something, again, you have to keep in mind that uh, for the people who are condemned, uh, you know, for eternity, our Lord never says that they go to hell, does he? Not well, that I can to, call. Yeah, I don't know. To, I mean, I, yeah, you have to take my word for it, I guess. But it would be worth taking a look at that. He never uses the, um, uh, the phrase hell, which in Greek was Hades, Hades, uh, he never uses that for the place of condemnation. He calls it Gehenna. 
That was the term that was used especially by the Pharisees. They use that term for the place of condemnation. They don't use Hades. Hades would be the equivalent of Sheol in Hebrew. And Hela is just, again, the Old English equivalent of Hades. It's the place where the shades went or the souls went, but it wasn't for torment and punishment. Um, and if the rich man, who, by the way, is punished not because he did something wicked, but he failed to do something good. And so perhaps as he is in torment and suffering, it's not because he is necessarily condemned to uh, the inferno or to Gehenna, but that he is going through a purifying fire because he does show, uh, you, you bring out a great, great point. He still had concern for his brothers. The people in uh, Gehenna or the, the damned don't love anybody. They want people to be destroyed. That's why the demons tempt us. They want us to suffer because they hate us. And this was something that uh, was, you know, a, a big difference between the rich man in the, the parable in uh, Luke chapter 16 versus people who would be in the eternal flame. When somebody is consigned to the eternal flames of Gehenna, our Lord says there is wailing and gnashing of teeth and the fire does not go out and the worm does not die. So they suffer for all eternity, but there are those who go to this place, this Hades, this um, Hela or Sheol, they could not enter heaven yet, but the Christ did come to open the gates of heaven for them, and that's why I preach. So they would have a chance, and that would include that rich man, if, if he were a real character. We, again, we see him in a parable. Um, could have been a real character, though. That's certainly a possibility, and it's very realistically drawn. And again, your point is absolutely correct. At least had love for his brothers that he, he's still trying to be bossy. He's still trying to tell the poor guy, Lazarus, uh, tell him to go do this. Tell him to go do that. Tell him to bring me water. Tell him to tell my brothers. Uh, he's, he hasn't quite gotten over the mentality that he's a rich guy who can boss people around and needs to learn to cut that out. But um, that would be something that is very important. We have another caller, Mary. Where are you calling from? Mary, you there? See my phone call. Oh. Hello, uh, hello, Father. Thanks hello. for taking my phone call. I'm calling yeah. from the lovely state of New Jersey. <laughs> I hear it. The sound of New Jersey comes straight from your voice. <laughs> <laughs> so what can we do for you? My husband is we just recently last year completed his initiation into the Catholic Church. Uh -huh. And um, he's got a great devotion to the Rosary and St. <laughs> Michael's Chaplet. And so you say the Apostles' Creed <coughs> often. And he want, was asking why, and I taught religious education for close to 30 years, and I could not find an answer to this. In the Apostles' Creed, it said, we say... Um, <coughs> He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. Mm -hmm. But during Mass in the Nicene Creed, we say he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended. Oh, see, now what the older version does say he descended to the dead. Uh -huh. On the third day, he rose again. But the current version of, of the prayer that we say in church does not have that. 
And so mm-hmm. my question was going to be, why is it in one creed and not the other? Here, here is the reason. You know, the, the Apostles' Creed has 12 basic statements of faith, okay? Mm-hmm. And it it's, gives a, a basic statement of the faith. The Nicene Creed comes out of the Council of Nicaea, and they were dealing with a completely different problem. It wasn't that they were just looking for a summary of the faith, but they were looking for a clarification on the nature of God, because you had uh, people like the priest, Arius, who denied that Jesus is God the Son. And he considered Jesus to be a creature rather than God. So in the Nicene Creed, they were dealing with a heresy that actually, you know, it was a very important issue to address because very, very many people were converting to Christianity. This is just, you know, tw- uh, 12 years after the last and greatest of the persecutions, the persecution of Diocletian. And now a lot of Christianity was legalized by Constantine, and lots of people were entering. But we see that, you know, they were accommodating their understanding of Jesus to their own pagan notions and just making Jesus a creature with divine qualities, sort of like Achilles and some of the ancient Greek heroes of mythology. And the Nicene Creed focused on you know, saying the the earlier part of the creed, he is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Those clarifications are what their focus, (coughs) excuse me, that's what their focus is. So that's why they weren't, nobody was doubting Jesus' descent to the dead, but they were doubting his divinity. That's why they focused on it. Does that help? I guess she's gone. All right, let us now go over to Bert in Pennsylvania. Bert, what can we do for you? Truly he is risen. Indeed he is risen. Father, I question what happened on the vigil mass in reading Mark's gospel this past weekend. Verse 8 is omitted. We only read verse 1 through 7, and we do not read the uh, long version of the end of Mark. My question revolves around, why is verse 8 omitted, where the women left the tomb frightened and afraid? Yeah, I suspect because the guys who came up with the lectionary were about as frightened and scared as the women. That would be my, my first response. You know, it's um, something that they uh, just didn't want. But you're right. Verse 8 goes right on and says that the women were so frightened, they didn't say anything. Now, one of the things um, that we definitely want to, to deal with, when you go through the Gospel of Mark, there are a number of times people are frightened and amazed using exactly the same words as applied to those women. So what we've got is the reaction of the women is similar to the reaction of Peter when Jesus walks on the water, the reaction of the apostles when Jesus calms the storm, and a number of other times that every time in in the Gospel of Mark something amazing happens, uh, even when Jesus announces his death and resurrection, they are frightened and amazed. And the women are sharing in that, and that fear and silence fits their uh, sense of recognition of an act of God. 
That's one of the things going on. Something that is an act of nature is that we've run out of time. <laughs> this is not a divine act. I want to encourage you to join Deacon Harold Burke Sivers on EWTN Live tomorrow night. Uh, it'll be great to have him. And I want to give you a blessing. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you and lead you in all of your ways to His peace and resurrection. Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed, He is risen. And again, we ask you to keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill so that we can pay all of our bills and keep bringing you these programs and especially this, the specials coming up this weekend of Divine Mercy. God bless you and thank you. Thank you.